AIDS brings a response Fighting from the government. AIDS, the disease which claims life. Welcome to Extra Tea with your camp host, William Hampson, and my fabulous co-host, Gloria. Between us, we'll be looking back through the decades at how Britain reported on the AIDS pandemic. And where we will try to unpick individual stories in the newspaper archives from the 80s, 90s, and noughties. Ready? Ready. All right, let's do it. Ah, hello, you. Yes, you. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you. Because in this episode, it's just you and me. As Gloria has gone off on a little vacation, a little summer vacation, that's a holiday to you and me. Although I'm sure that she's not going to be slavering herself in Amber Soleil on a beach in Frinton-on-Sea. Because she came to me and she said, Will, I want to go on a British traditional seaside holiday. Where do you recommend? I said, blimey, we have so much to offer here in the UK. I said, out of some of the places I've been, I said I could recommend Blackpool if you want something very traditional. I said, you've got the nice sandy beaches, the donkey shit, the Blackpool Tower. Or you can go over to Scarborough if you fancy something a little bit more poncy. Or you can go to Whitby if you want the scampi and chips. You've got Great Yarmouth for the nice sandy beaches and the amusement rides. You've got Frinton-on-Sea for the gorgeous beach huts and the excellent water quality. You've got Brighton if you want the pebbled beach. You can go to Bournemouth, slow pace of life. You know, lots of mobility scooters, but gorgeous beaches. Or if you really want to go somewhere posh, go to Cornwall. And she said, yes, yes, where do you recommend? I said, well, out of all those places, I said, the most salubrious British seaside holiday destination in the UK is... Clacton on Sea. And that's where she's gone. And she sent me a text message on her train journey to Clacton on Sea, which simply just reads, having a whale of a time. Hmm. Well, I'm sure she'll have a fantastic time. <laughs> Clacton's lovely. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll get to hear all about it when she gets back. If, if she comes back. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yes. So today it is just you and me. Well, that's a little bit of a fib because I have two amazing guests who will be joining us to talk about their friend, colleague, flatmate, business partner, the uber-talented music composer, John Lewis. But before we do, let's take a look at the newspaper articles from 1985. Now, the press report extensively on a young man who has just passed away on the AIDS isolation ward at Ham Green Hospital in Bristol. Now, John remains unnamed because he is one of only three patients on the ward at the time, but they do allude to John and his condition via his age. And then, only days later, John himself sadly passes away on the 3rd of February 1985, and the Bristol Evening Post report John's death the following day on the 4th of February 1985, but do not name John until the 6th of February 1985, where they ran the front page headline, Gay Plague, Man Named. And the article reads, Exclusive. The West's second AIDS victim was identified this afternoon as composer Mr John Lewis, aged 40. Mr Lewis, who lived in Bath, specialised in electronic music and ran a private London studio called Electrophon. His work was well known to members of the BBC's Radiophonic Workshop in London. Mr Lewis died in Ham Green Hospital near Bristol on Sunday after contracting acquired immune deficiency syndrome. He had been kept in an isolation ward because the virus, which can be passed by homosexual contact, is so virulent. Mr Lewis caught fungal meningitis after all his resistance to disease was broken down by AIDS. Bath and District Coroner Mr Percy Pepler has called for reports before deciding whether to hold an inquest on Mr Lewis. Mr Pepler said today, quote, I have asked for reports from a consultant at the hospital and from the pathologist who would carry out the post-mortem if one is necessary. I expect to receive their reports by tomorrow. If I am satisfied that this man died from natural causes, then an inquest will not be necessary and I shall not submit the pathologist to the risk of performing a post-mortem. We heard this a lot in 1985. So for those of you who have listened to AIDS and Lost Voices before will know that we take these articles reporting an individual's HIV AIDS related death or a HIV AIDS related event and we try and rewind and find out more about the person and, and more often than not learn they were so much more than an HIV AIDS diagnosis or a HIV AIDS story in the newspapers. In short, we try and capture a more individual or, or humane story, something the press at the time so often, if not deliberately, failed to do. And as we worked on series one of this podcast, this and a couple of other articles from 1985 reporting John Lewis's death just 
kept popping out at me when I was researching those in series one. And a soft search on John Lewis didn't yield much, but something was telling me this story just wanted to be discovered and told. So as soon as we finished series one, I started straight away to find out more about John Lewis. And this is what I discovered. Reginald John Lewis was born on the 26th of July 1944 in Davidson, Saskatchewan, Canada. John and his older brother of five years, David, were born to parents David Reginald Lewis and Minnie Ann Big. While John's mother Minnie, Mickey, to those that knew her best, was born in Saskatchewan in 1912, her father Robert was born in Milton, Kent, and mother Minnie was born in Farnham, Surrey, England. John's father, David Reginald, was born in Wrexham, Wales in 1908 before emigrating to Canada in 1911, aged three with his parents, John's grandparents. John's father worked as an accountant for a lumber company and his mother, Minnie, worked alongside her husband as his assistant secretary clerk. The family moved from Davidson, Saskatchewan to Edmonton, Alberta, where John attended the Virginia Park School, just a stone's throw from the family's modest home on 74th Street Northwest. John then moved on to St. Stephen's College at the University of Alberta in 1962, where he studied English, philosophy and fine art music. May 1963 saw John appear for the first time in radio listings in the local newspaper, the Edmonton Journal, with a regular one-hour slot playing the organ on Canada's CKUA radio station, where John soon became their music commentator. Notably, during his university years, John preferred to drop his forename Reginald, given his yearbook photos are cited as John Lewis and referenced in the index as Reginald John Lewis. By 1964, John is a member of the St. Stephen's College House Committee and also a part of the College Fraternity Choir, taking part in their 12th annual Songfest as a bass singer. In the same year of 1964, on the 24th of June, John received the Eva Shaw Memorial Prize in Music after being nominated by the University Department of Music for being a student of, quote, outstanding merit. Then, in 1966, Alberta University broadcast their concert hall series on the CKUA radio station, where a music composition by John, among six other students, had been chosen to be broadcast on the 7th of May, 1966. By November of the same year, John had put forward an application that was endorsed by the University of Alberta and put before a committee for one of the world's most prestigious scholarships, Rhodes. The scholarship was so prestigious that to be endorsed by the university, an applicant was not only required to possess a bachelor's degree, but also demonstrate, quote, outstanding academic achievement. John found himself competing with two of his peers, a Mr. Clogg, a Bachelor of Commerce, and a Mr. Mackenzie, a Bachelor of Geography. The committee panel of seven, headed by Justice Kane, a former Rhodes Scholar himself, and a judge at Alberta Supreme Court, awarded the scholarship to Mr. Mackenzie on the 21st of November 1966. John, now in his final year at the University of Alberta in 1967, is photographed for the Edmonton Journal sitting at the piano. The headline reads, Promising Artist Commission to be Played by Winnipeg Group. The article reports that 22-year-old John, the prize student of Miss Archer, his associate professor in the Serious Study of Art of Composition, has been selected as Alberta's representative for a centennial workshop. John's specially crafted music composition for the occasion will be played by the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. The Edmonton Journal states, quote, A real thrill for him, since it will be the first time his work has been performed by a full orchestra and a major one at that. Simultaneously, John was also commissioned to compose music for the Decamera Singers for the centennial year and the 24-voice ensemble performed John's commission, What the Vinters Buy. John Lewis, B.A., gained his Bachelor in Music announced in the Edmonton Journal on the 23rd of May 1967. He continued to broadcast on CKUA Radio as a music commentator in his regular slots and remained the music director at the Highlands United Church, a position he had held since 1966. John's proud parents, Reg and Minnie, placed an announcement in their local newspaper, the Brooks Bulletin, on the 25th of April 1968. In it, they congratulate John on winning a British Commonwealth scholarship to, quote, continue his music studies in London, England. But before heading to London in the same year, John played in various concerts, including two summer concerts in association with Alberta University and an organ concert at St. Joseph's Cathedral on the 1st of August 1968. 
John is confirmed as having accepted the scholarship given he is listed in the British Commonwealth Scholarship Directory and most likely arrived in London mid to late August 1968 to begin his scholarship in September of the same year. Now, it is not clear where in London John took up his scholarship, but John is mentioned in the Daily Telegraph on the 10th of November 1969, having been credited with composing music for a performance titled Alternations by Greg Mayher. Mayher was an American modern dance teacher at South Kensington Institute, now known as Imperial College, and at the Dance Centre which was located on 12 Floral Street, Covent Garden. Interestingly, John would come back to this genre when commissioned by Ballet Rombert in a few years' time. Then, in the years between 1970 and 1972, John studied advanced composition under the renowned German composer Hans Werner Hans in Rome. John's return to England from Rome is next documented in the Daily Telegraph newspaper on the 26th of April 1973, having composed music for a ballet titled Red Shift directed by dancer Caroline Carlson. And around this time, April 1973, John's music career led me to the archives at Ballet Rombert, where I learned they commissioned John in 1973 to write the score of Isold, choreographed by Norman Morris. The score had its premiere at Sadler's Wells Theatre in London on the 27th of September 1973. John was also credited as the assistant music director as I sold Todd theatres around the country. And John's work with Ballet Rombert didn't end there because he was again commissioned to write the score for Spindrift, which was choreographed by Norman Morris, which premiered at the Camden Roundhouse on the 17th of April 1974. John was also accredited as writing the score and touring with the company as assistant musical director and pianist in performances in theatres up and down the UK. In the absence of John, the accomplished Carlos Miranda occasionally assumed the role. Spindrift was last performed at the Theatre Wyweren on the 3rd of May 1975. But sadly, John's score for Spindrift doesn't survive in the archive. And it's a real shame because our first guest tells a lovely story about meeting John Lewis and hearing this composition by John for Spindrift for the first time. But what does survive is a piece of music that our guest and John Lewis composed, recorded at their Electron studio and released via Polydor on their first album, Where Are We Captain? So let's take a listen. And now I'm joined by a very special guest, a thoroughly lovely man. He was a friend, business partner and the other half of the group Wavemaker under Electrophon Studios. It's Mr. Brian Hodgson. But I should probably first say for any Doctor Who fans that may have landed here, maybe somewhat disappointed that while we're in the presence of Mr. Brian Hodgson, there won't be much Doctor Who chat because Brian has joined me to tell us more about his dear friend, the late John Lewis. But first, Brian, could you share why you are so greatly admired by Doctor Who fans all over the world? Somebody once said, what, what's it like to be a household man? And I said, it's a bit like Harpic, but not half as useful. <laughs> so, yeah, I suppose it. I mean, I was the original sound designer for Doctor Who, right from the word go. We will come on to how John himself became associated with Doctor Who a little later. But first, your role as sound designer for Doctor Who and eventually head of BBC Radiophonic Workshop. You are recognised all over the world and greatly admired for creating the sound of the TARDIS and the voice of the Daleks, I believe. That's the iconic thing. I mean, I seem to remember I've got some sort of award or Hall of Fame from the... If you... Excuse me, I'll just go and grab it if I can still find it. It's uh, from Cult TV, the fourth International Cult TV Awards Hall of Fame, Beck the TARDIS, uh, Doctor Who. As modest as you are, I'm clearly in the presence of a cult TV icon. But am I right in saying that I, I think I read an article somewhere that said that you yourself are not a Doctor Who fan? No, I worked on it. <laughs> 
I, do, I am more of a Doctor Who fan now because I think Russell's script and shooting are, are really good. Let's face it, we were working with no equipment, cardboard sets, when it all started, but it was in other people's imagination, mm. you know, in, sp- in spite of the wobbly walls and things <laughs> like that, mm-hmm. um, which is all they could afford at the time. We were able to, to create another world in people's minds. Sound and the backgrounds and everything helped that enormously. And of course, nobody had heard a, a sick tune like Doctor Who before. Mm, an amazing theme tune. And I guess at the time, sounds that were unrecognisable, but today are instantly recognisable to be associated with, with Doctor Who. And this is coming from somebody like myself who's never watched an episode of Doctor Who. I would be able to instantly recognise the Doctor Who theme tune. And of course, the the very famous and iconic voices of the Daleks. Well, I, of course, the, uh, the voice was an important part of the Dalek. Mm. Uh, I worked with Peter Hawkins, who was one of the most lovely men you could ever meet. He was such a sweetheart, helpful, and a brilliant actor. And we had to devise something. So we did a few experimental sessions till we got it right with yeah. Richard Martin, who was the director. And Brian, are they still using the same voices on Doctor Who today? They, they still use the same treatment on the right. voice. It's a modulated at 30 cycles. And so it's a ring modulated voice. I mean, I devised the basic treatment for a radio program called Swords from the Stars, where they had a robot butler. It was called the Jones Robot. I used my own voice, you know, as an actor. So I used my own voice for that. And he was very polite. He was a bit like, is it, is it 3CPO or something? A very well spoken butler, he was. So I'd done that treatment. It was a modification of that treatment. We decided to use the Daleks. I said, you're going to have to elongate the vowels. Otherwise, we won't hear the modulation. It was a combination of his performance and the treatment. It was magic. And, of course, the writing, all of those who know, exterminate, annihilate. <laughs> so, uh, but we had to be very careful, so it was intelligible. In the original, when we first did it, Peter would actually sit in the studio uh, while they were shooting things with a, the old sports mic, you know, uh, on the lip, and they oh. they would apply the treatment. Unfortunately, they lost the ring modulator we originally used, which was a post office one. So we had to devise other things. And of course, later when synthesizers came along. It was very easy to reproduce. And am I right in saying that you created the sound of the TARDIS from applying a house key to the strings of a carcass of a piano? Yeah, my mum's house key. (laughs) Yeah, well, it was quite interesting because in a fit of madness, I shouldn't have done it, I offered that that piano to children in need. Radio 2, I think, did it. They auctioned it to a farmer who came down to pick it up. And I screwed the key, actually, to the frame of the piano. And we put a thing on it saying this was the piano. You know, he, he was a bit taken aback because he thought it was a real piano because he bought it for his granddaughter. So anyway, we gave him lunch and he went off with the piano in his thing. Now somewhere in the country, probably mouldering away in a barn on somebody's farm, was the original piano. Oh, no. Well, I am a little bit of a Jessica Fletcher, so I think we'll have to do a bit of investigating and find out what happened to the piano. But of course, we're here today to talk about your dear friend, John Lewis, business partner at Electrophone Studios, colleague, half of Wavemaker, which saw you both release several albums. How did you both meet and what were your first impressions of John? Oh, absolute utter attraction. We met at a party one afternoon and... uh, I'd been working with a sculptor called Peter Logan and doing mechanical ballet. And I'd left the BBC. I was had my own studio in uh, Covent Garden in Neil's Yard. And so there were loads of people there, you know, painters, things, people who were doing things. And it was, it was a very informal party. I can't even remember who was giving it. But um, I spied John and was immediately attracted because he was a great-looking guy. Mm. Uh, and, and I asked him what he was doing, uh, what, what he did. He said, I'm a composer. I said, well, I've got a studio in Covent Garden in Neil's Yard. So I said, what are you doing later? And he said, oh, I'm finishing a score, which I've got to deliver tomorrow. So that was it. And I said, well, I, let's 
hope we bump into each other again. I, I was just starting a relationship at the time, so I, I was sort of still a little bit seeing how things pan down. Yeah. So I was to, well, asked to, because of my contact with Peter Logan, Christopher Bruce of Ballet Rombe asked me if I'd, I'd do a sound score for one of his ballets, and so I did that. And I went used to go to the rehearsal in the Rombe rehearsal rooms, and one day I was just leaving after the rehearsal walking down the stairs past the music studio and the orchestra was playing and I stopped. I thought, God, that's really terrific music. I love it. So I stayed to the end of rehearsal and then John came out after the rehearsal, <sighs> much to my surprise, and we became friends. We're not, we weren't close mm. at, at this point. I mean, we, I mean, I had no idea of his domestic yeah. things and he hadn't much idea of mine either. But we stayed in contact and we'd bump into each other at rehearsal rooms and things like that. And then for the next ballet I did with Christopher Bruce, he'd invited, one bird invited uh, Lou Falco over from New York to choreograph a ballet for them. It was called Tutti Frutti. And the score was by Bert Alcantara. And that, I loved that. It was great. I said to Bert, would you like to redo it as an album? I got an electronic music studio and he was into synthesizers. He had his own art and I had some very special custom built sequences and things like that. And, uh, and so we remade it. And then John came by one day and he said, I want to buy a synthesizer. Would you come and advise me? So we went off together. And we went to Tottenham Court Road where most of the people had only ever sold electric organs. Right. And they seemed to know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to John, well, you know, why don't you come out of the studio and why don't you join me? Instead of buying a synthesizer, I've got all the gear. So we then did Where Are We Captain, followed by New Atlantis. Some document that John co-founded Electrophon Studios with you, but from what you share, this isn't quite the case, is it? No, he didn't. No. Electrophon no. was founded by Delia Derbyshire and myself. But Delia was in a, a quite depressive state at that point. Right. Then she decided she wanted out of everything and wanted to go. Yeah. And she went off to become a radio operator on the gas pipeline. She spoke French. And it was an Anglo-French crew laying it. So it was really nice started Electrophone, but she put a one tape recorder in as her contribution. I bought everything else because I whipped all my pension out of the BBC. Oh, black. <laughs> I had about 2,000 quid in pensions. So I, I, I cashed it in. Spent all that money setting up the studio. And the studio cost us eight quid a week. I mean, in the middle of Covent Garden in Neil's yard, you know, it's ridiculous. Wow, that sounds cheap today. But was, was that expensive in the 70s? In those days, it was fairly all right. I think we were paying right. 10 quid for a flat. I mean, I, I remember in, in the, the late 70s, beginning of the 80s, uh, a bottle of champagne at Louise's club was three pounds. <gasps> oh, <laughs> It was a very <laughs> wonderful channel, but you know, if you were being extravagant, that was what it was. We were used to using public transport, none of us drove. I mean, so many nights I've walked from uh, the club at Louise's back home because at the time I think I had a, a flat in Shepherd's Bush. And I'd walk back to Shepherd's Bush at two in the morning. You know. mm. I have a friend that walks from central London to Shepherd's Bush, and I do the same actually to where I live, but um. Neil's Yard has been made to look very inscrambled these days. However, it's probably one part of London that's gone relatively untouched. Do you remember what number the warehouse was, where your studio, Electrophone, was based? Neil's Yard, it was number, I think it was number eight, Neil's Yard. Number eight, Neil's Yard. And when you proposed John join you at Electrophone Studios, did did he jump at the chance? No, he was interested and he was eager to do it. And we had a, a couple of albums to do, so... You know, we were in our elements. We enjoyed working together. Yeah. Easy person to work with. I mean, all this pernickety stuff wasn't part of that relationship. No. I mean, I suppose if I'd lived with him, he'd have driven me mad. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had a relationship for 38 years when my partner died, but he was in the film industry. Yeah. Well, a lot of the time he'd be out of the country for large parts of the year and I reckon that's the only reason we survived here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. um, oh and 
Yourself and John, you released your first album with Polydor, Where Are We Captain, under the name Wavemaker and from your studio, Electrophon. How did you both feel when you made the release? Were you nervous? Were you excited? There never was much excitement when you put anything up for release with Polydor because they normally released it on the secret list. So oh. you knew sometimes whether it was even released or not. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, but well, we John or I would give a party in because the, the warehouse was great. We had what tiny corner of the warehouse, right? Other artists working around, yeah. and film editors and things on the other floors. So we give a big party for the Lord. I had a good friend in Covent Garden called Kath Keeley, and her family were an old Covent Garden family, and they'd been in flowers and pubs and everything. So she used to decorate the rafters of the warehouse with garlands of, of hops and things. Really? Through our other relatives, uh, we'd buy loads and loads of strawberries. There's oh. always been an enormous bowl of strawberries and cream. And I think it was odd bins had just opened around the corner in. Ah, odd bins, the off license. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was the first shop. They were in opposite Martin's Lane. And so we could buy cheap sparkling wine. I mean, actually, what well, didn't seem cheap at the time. No. But it was about 17 quid a case. So, <laughs> I mean, prices are, are, are just bear no comparison to today. None at all. And so we'd have a great time. And, you know, people like Annie Nightingale would come along. Anne was always a great fan of ours, actually. I don't think anybody else on the radio was. But, but she was great. We, not none of the West Marsh hit albums. I mean, they would, they would go on. I mean, electronic albums at that time were fairly rare and we maybe sell a couple of thousand, but they sort of, it was like Electric Storm, which we did with David Dorhouse. It was one of those things that just stays there and keeps selling gradually over the years. Mm, and I think you can see as well with the age of social media and video platforms, there are endless comments of people absolutely thrilled to be reunited with your music, with, with Wavemaker's music after all these years. And they state that they either threw away stupidly, some say, their, their vinyl and their record players given technological advances, or they say they heard the track on the radio all those years ago, scrambled for a pen and paper to jot down the, the track name and, and your, the artist's name, Wavemaker, but could just never find it on, on vinyl. Because I, mean, I, I love Chibley Bells, you know, which is a terrific album. But it was also on Polyphone, and I think we were virtually released in the shadow of Jubilee Bells. It's not everybody's taste. <laughs> but it did receive positive press at the time, and it's it's clearly nostalgic for many today. But interestingly, on the new Atlantis album, on the insert, it says that one track is a homage to John's favourite composer. Well, I only studied with Hans Werner Hansen. Mm, and I suppose it was only years from him studying under him to, to releasing the album. So I suppose that could possibly be the link to his favourite composer. But what I also wanted to ask you, Brian, was in 1977, John Lewis, under the wave maker name, released Mickey Moonshine and Tunnel of Love, which was written by Ben Cross, the stage and film actor, perhaps best known for his role in the film Chariots of Fire. Given Wavemaker was yourself and John as the duo, did you have any role in these tracks? Yeah, only insofar as we'd created the the track. Right. I do like to find. Uh, ben was working as, in a musical. He decided to make it with Mickey Moonshine. And John, John used to play in orchestras, theatre orchestras at night. Ah, so he got Ben to come in. He he written this thing which we'd used at a launch, Molten Brown at the Rolls Royce showrooms in Berkeley Square. Oh wow! We, we did an evening then. Joe put a band together, and, and it, we called it Tapioca. <laughs> um, so this original track was was called Tapioca. The Mickey Moonshine track. Yeah, really. Tapping track. But we, our title for it was Tapioca. I, I was not part of that joke. Right. <laughs> the track was created in, in our studio by John. And in 1977, I find an article in the newspapers relating to John Lewis and Ben Cross working with the Swingle Singers. I think it was up in Manchester. But do you recall if John was working with the Swingle Singers? Not about Ben being involved, but John was became pianist for the Swingles. Really? 
Yeah, I, I, I think he did a couple of shows with them. He came across the, their manager when he was, uh, you know, playing in theatres. Right. It, it, musicals. So, so I remember their manager was immensely tall. Um, nice man, but immensely tall. And John was warned, you know, not to do a sort of, oh, my goodness, you're tall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because he's quite sensitive about his <laughs> height. <laughs> anyway, very proud. He walked. He walked into the fun studio to see, to see me, John. And John said, oh, "My God, you are tall." <gasps> <laughs> How did he respond? Uh, he was fine. <laughs> That's good, good. So you and John are busy at Electrophone Studios at Neil's Yard. Then comes an invitation for you to return to the BBC Radiophonic Workshop as the assistant head. And we know you accepted. But what I wanted to ask was, was it an easy decision to make? Sort of, because, I mean, John was quite capable of of running the studio. I mean, I was invited to apply for the job. and And so it was Delia, in fact. She didn't. And various internal candidates. Richard and I had just bought a house, as all we were buying a house. It was 1979. I think it was 1979. So I moved into the house on the last day of October 1979. I mean, I always said if I went back, I go back on my terms. Mm. I wanted freehand to equip, re equip, and everything. I didn't actually give a fuck whether I got a job or not. So when I did, I said, well, I, you can't, I can't come for three months because I've got to teach John to take over the complete running of the studio. Yeah. That was it. They, to my astonishment, they agreed that, and so I went back. Uh, my assistant at the time, John Gibbs, who took over John Lewis's score for Doctor Who, and completed it. Um, so now that John's running the Electrophon studio and you're back at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, and I recall you telling me that if you were ever in town, um, you used to pop into the Electrophon studio to, to say hi to John. But did you ever work from the studio again? Oh, I still had access to the studio right. because I was asked to do a play for BBC Radio and there was no facilities available at the workshop at the time. Right. And I very seldom did any creative work after I went back, but I particularly wanted to do this. I forget what it was. Anyway, I went down and I did it at Electrophon Studio. And I, I wasn't charged to rate it. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, but you go on to become the head of the BBC Radio Phonic Workshop and John becomes involved in composing incidental music for Doctor Who. I believe it was Mark of the Rani. How did that come about? John Nathan Turner, when he took over Doctor Who, asked us to redo the signature, and Peter Hull did that. And it was the only one that Delia approved of. And then, because Dudley Simpson had taken on the incidental music for Blake Seven, and John felt that was a a betrayal, because Dudley was the resident composer for Doctor Who at the time. And so John came to me and said, you've got to keep the secret, because I haven't spoken to Dudley yet. Uh, could a couple of your guys do a, a test thing writing the music, the incidental music? So uh, Peter Howell and Paddy Kingsley, they got to do it. They had to get utterly secret because what another member of staff, uh, Dick Mills, was still working with Dudley. And to keep it a secret from Dick was uh, almost impossible, but I did. It was the only secret we ever managed to keep. And so the, the Peter and, and Paddy carried on doing music, and then John said, I quite like you some outside composers. So I said, well, yeah, it's my ex business partner, John Lewis, and he did a, a demo, and John liked it, so he was commissioned to do one. This was really just as he was building up to developing AIDS. And the awful thing was, you see, the hysteria at the time, I mean, people that didn't know what it was, so this was a, a killer plague. It was poppers. The first um, symptoms tended to be pneumonia, and of course, poppers and lungs. And the murder press were, you know, splashing it all over you. Have you, have you got AIDS? Or yeah. and with ridiculous articles. Mm. Um, and Brian, did you recall if he displayed or mentioned 
any symptoms that perhaps raise concern, given, as you say, the press attention at the time and the, and the rhetoric around HIV, especially amongst gay men, you know, when they were terming it as the gay plague. Did, did John raise any concerns at all? I mean, the first no. thing I remember going to the studio and John saying, I really worry I've got this awful rash from my wrists up to the elbows. And they showed me and I said, well, that looks like an allergy rash. You know, have you changed the washing up liquid you use or whatever? Because that's what it looked like. Oh. And you mentioned to me that John was admitted to the Middlesex Hospital in London. Do you recall how he became to be admitted? Oh, well, he had got a pneumonia. Oh, he'd got a pneumonia. Yeah, so he went in and they, they, that's where they said, you know, HIV. Oh, and how did he take it? He, he was fine. You know, yeah. At that point where people were saying, oh, you know, there'll be a cure soon. Mm. The, the basic things. We were trying to keep him alive long enough for the cure to happen. Mm. Of course, it took a lot longer than everybody thought. Um, and so I, I visited him there. And then we decided, after the pneumonia, that because the electron studio was very dusty, Gareth, who was one of John's best friends, and Ian, who was part of Polio Society, who was a good friend of John's, who had this property in the West Country, we decided to move the entire studio, cottage he'd got in the West Country, and we literally packed the entire studio up moves it down there, think of the clean air, electronic equipment gathers dust by static, and we were able to clean everything, so it all went pristine and lovely, down to the West Country. I mean, this was all literally months or so before he died. And as yourself and I and many Doctor Who fans know, John never did get to finish his score. No, I, mean, I, don't, I think the director, I don't think she liked his score very much. I n- I'd, n- I'd never heard it. Whether she didn't like his style or whatever, or whether she decided she didn't like it after he died of AIDS. But John Gibbs took over and he did the eventual score. And I, you know, I, I said she rang me up hysterically when the, I informed the Doctor Who office and they informed her that John was dead. And do you recall how you learned that, that John had sadly passed away? I had a phone call from, I think it was Big Gareth, and then they were all, literally all hell broke loose. Ugh, and this is with the press. With the press. Yet strangely enough, everyone's getting very hysterical. And But my Richard, my partner, said it all passed. It all passed. And literally, I think the thing, shock and horror at the BBC, referred to somebody else. I think it was right. for- following Sunday. Yes, because when we first started speaking, you said to me that another story came up and, and thankfully the press attention towards John's passing um, had then moved on because obviously we know how the press works. But this was the Sunday Mirror on the 17th of February 1985 where they ran the headline, AIDS death shock at BBC, take action now with a strap line, gay allowed to work on. He was obviously much higher profile than John was. With John Nathan Turner, I don't think he ever forgave me for introducing John. And he then took all the, the Doctor Who work away from the workshop. Really? So so he'd taken away all the Doctor Who work from yourself at the Radiophonic Workshop just because you'd introduced John, John Lewis, and, and John had died of AIDS-related complications? Yeah. Oh. I'm speechless. Oh, but you mentioned as well just a few moments ago. Was it the the direct the director of Doctor Who was also a little hysterical that you know John had died of age related complications? But I mean, I don't blame her at all because the Murdoch press had found this hysteria, and and ne- because nobody knew really. I got the, the specialists speak to her. Uh, you know, explain it. Just to it jump was, in here, you could probably hear that the sound was getting a bit muddled up due to a few technical gremlins. But Brian was basically just saying that he'd put the director of Doctor Who in touch with John's HIV AIDS consultant at the hospital where he passed away to try and allay any fears she had in regards to HIV and AIDS. 
deep involvement. It was not something you pick off my glass. Yeah. It, it, it was an exchange of bodily fluids. Um, but no, I agree. You know, it's just incredibly sad. And still to this day, it's, it's incredibly bizarre to believe that the newspapers reported on it often the way that they did, which made people believe that they could catch HIV AIDS in just ways that just weren't even possible. But, oh. Yeah, it was, it was a bad time. Mm. Um, I couldn't and, go to the funeral because I, I was worried, and it was in Bristol, but I was worried that the press would be waiting there. You know. Oh, they're just awful. And when we spoke prior, you mentioned that the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and even your own home was besieged by the press who were relentless. Uh, my, my house had calls, uh, but the radiophonic work, I had a lot of calls because of the Doctor Who thing. Connection. And did anybody ever find out how the press came to learn that John had been working on Doctor Who, you know, in their endeavours to try and create a, a story to no doubt vilify and sensationalise his passing? John must have chatted to one of the nurses. Right. Obviously. He'd been chatting about it to friends and things, and then the press rang. Uh, or, I, mean, I don't know how that information got leaked, but it but, came... And it could have just been a, a well-intended comment, really, you know, no, nothing malicious behind it, but you know how the press... You know, they were they were leaping onto anything. To yeah. No, it's... And you also mentioned to me John's mother, Minnie. I met her. She was a lovely lady. She, she was called Mickey, actually. Which was all referred to as Mickey. Lovely Canadian lady. Proud of John. Was she? Yeah. And, uh, of course, John was an organ scholar originally. No, she was delightful. I mean, just the sort of mum I thought John would have. Oh, it's lovely. And and it's so nice to hear that you were saying that she was immensely proud of what he was doing. And when you leave the BBC in 1995, you go on to do something very special in light of the friends you'd lost including John, to HIV and AIDS. Yeah, of course. I, I, I was studying hypnotherapy, and, and as part of hypnotherapy, you should also study counselling. So I went to the college based at St. Charles Hospital in Labrador Grove. I did a BTEC in complementary health care there. One of the girls on the course of myself had a little private practice once we got our certificates in Harley Street. We called it on Wednesday, which was... Uh, just one day a week, and we literally would book a consulting room, oh. depending on how many clients we had. Yeah, you could do that. It's one of the rooms you rented by the hour, which I think is oh. it is a, a line from Water Gypsies. Oh. Um, yeah, and then uh, I was involved with a an AIDS charity in Kensington which uh, was either changed from premises or closed down. Then I got involved with Body Positive, which was supported by Elton John. Then suddenly one night, you know, night I found a call saying, don't come tomorrow, we've closed Body Positive. I said, well, you closed it? You know, what mm-hmm. happened? And, uh, you, I, and I said, well, I need to contact all my my clients or patients. And they said, no, you're not allowed to do that. Ah. It really was. I, literally, the door was slammed in our faces. Really? Yeah. And um, that's awful, if not if not terrifying, that a service could just be stopped like that. And the services you're providing are to people that are HIV AIDS positive in a time when there is no effective treatment. And you're helping them come to terms with their diagnosis. Yeah. I mean, in those days, people lost a lot of confidence and they were suffering from emotional shock. Rebuilding their confidence and their capacity for dealing with the situation. Mm. We couldn't offer any cures. Some really quite advanced techniques I used to make them feel that they were in control of the situation. It wasn't the situation in control of them. That worked very well. I think it helped a lot of people, got them through some of the bad times. And of course I had, at the same time, I had dear friends who were also in the same situation. Yeah, it's... It's it's a time, Brian, when many like yourself didn't have to have contracted HIV or be living with AIDS for it to have an impact on, on you and, and your life as well through, through living through those times and seeing firsthand your friends lose their lives to, to this disease. Yeah, including several people I uh, had sexual relationship. Um, never. Never contracted it yourself. 
many men, gay men especially, who lost so many have shared they carry what, what they term as survivor's guilt. Is that something you perhaps can recognise yourself? I've, I only felt guilt in the way that, you know, they were dying and I hadn't contracted it. And that I couldn't do more to help. Yeah. I, I, there was one particular Sunday where I felt dreadful because I got a phone call saying that a friend of mine was dying and marred me. And he would likely not survive the day. And it was my birthday. Like the whole family had travelled down from north of England and up from Gloucester. And, and I never, I couldn't get down to the hospital. And he passed away without uh, me being there. Oh, and, and so many people were infected by the blood transfusions. And so you know, we, your podcast should be in their memory as well. Mm, you're right. It's always worthwhile remembering that this disease didn't affect and doesn't affect just gay men. I mean, disproportionately, yes. But, you know, we also covered the story in, in the first series of baby Anthony Forbes, who received a blood transfusion after being born prematurely over in America and received contaminated blood and then sadly passed away from AIDS. And we also as well, a couple of episodes ago, covered the story of Roy Corns, who was a haemophiliac and received contaminated blood products in the factor eight that he was receiving that, you know, gave him HIV and then he later passed away from AIDS because there was no effective treatment. So yeah, you have to remember that, you know, there's so many other people as well that are affected by the same condition. But Brian, before we end this episode today, there's just one burning question that I've got in regards to your friend John Lewis is... What was his dress sense like? I think this will help me just build a bit more of a picture of John. You're, you're too young to remember the clone. You remember Jack's shirt and jeans. No, the clone thing was sort of the um, the lumberjack shirt and jeans. <laughs> Is that what he used to wear? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, with his handsome good looks and his tash and beard. Gosh, he sounds a dish. Brian Hodgson, thank you so much for taking the time to share more about yourself and your dear friend, John Lewis, the composer. And we specifically arranged to speak today, the 26th of July, 2024, on what would have been John's 80th birthday. So I think it's only right and just that we raise a glass and that you, if you will, lead a toast to his memory. Yeah, so let's not only toast to John, but all the friends we lost to the lovers, the people who supported them, and the people who were accidentally infected by blood transfusions and the rest. To all of them. To all of them. The music that welcomed my guest, Mr Brian Hodgson, was from his and John's album titled Where Are We Captain, which the duo released under their name Wavemaker via Polydor. And you're currently listening to a track from their second Wavemaker album titled New Atlantis, also released via Polydor. To learn more and listen to the music from Wavemaker, Brian Hodgson, John Lewis and their Electrophon Music Studio, visit the Extra T blog or Find the links in the show notes. Oh, ladies and gents, Brian Hodgson. What an absolute legend. And what a wonderful insight into John Lewis's life. It really does bring John to life, hearing from somebody who was an admirer, a friend, a colleague, a business partner. So, Brian Hodgson, thank you so much for your time. You were truly amazing and absolute gent. I very nearly made him late for choir practice. So, Brian Hodgson, thank you very much. Right. So, as we've just heard, Brian Hodgson and John Lewis were business partners at Electrophon Studio in Neil's Yard, Covent Garden. It was during this period in 1976 that brought sad news for John. John's father, David Reginald Lewis, had sadly passed away after a short illness on the 28th of May 1976 at Brooks General Hospital, Alberta, Canada. Then, Brian and John the following year in 1977 released their second album via Polydor Records from their Electrophon studio titled New Atlantis under their duo Wavemaker. Brian then returned to the BBC Radiophonic Workshop in December of that year and John now found himself alone at Electrophon and also lived alone at the flat he rented in Earl's Court. John kept himself fit with regular visits to the fitness centre and was also known to be a keen swimmer. With his handsome good looks and his gay clone image, he was not short of male attention. 
After all, John was living in Earl's Court, the very heart of London's gay capital in the 70s and 80s, way before it moved to Soho. And we just heard from Brian Hodgson that John also had connections with the Swingle Singers, having played as pianist at several of their concerts. John was also commissioned by the Swingle Singers, along with four other composers, to compose a track for their upcoming album titled Pieces of Eight. On the back of the album cover, it states, Here are eight original pieces composed and arranged for our group by five gentlemen who are currently making their mark in the contemporary pop field. It so happened that they are also friends of ours. John Lewis wrote a rather charming old-fashioned piece called Trouble with the Tune, the tale of a young lady haunted by the past. And this was another occasion where Ben Cross, star of stage and screen, worked alongside John in providing the lyrics for Trouble With The Tune. John is also credited as playing the, quote, electric keyboard on the recording at CBS Studios in London ahead of the 1977 release of the album Pieces of Eight. Then, the following year in 1978, John moved the short distance from his Earl's Court flat to a two-bedroomed upper-ground floor flat at 59 Elsham Road, London, minutes from Shepherd's Bush Tube Station, a mansion property in the borough of Kensington, Chelsea, that had just been converted into five flats two years prior. And who better to get an insight into what John was like to live with than guitarist, singer and songwriter Pete Davis. He became a flatmate at John's Elsham Road flat around 1979. And John came to work on Pete's record, I Am A Computer, at the Electrophon studio before Pete went on to release it and have it played on BBC Radio 1. I started by asking Pete what was the inspiration behind I Am A Computer. Computer. Are you a computer too? I'm a computer. Are you a you computer, computer too? Print out. It's okay. I mean, people like it, but of course, I obviously have mixed feelings because it's it's quite personal to me, and it reflects a time which was. Not my happiest time in my life, uh, but then, you know, which part is the happiest time of your life? It uh, yeah. can be a struggle at times, but it reminds me of trying to get a bit of money together, going to see John Lewis in his studio, hoping he'd turn up, you know, me being the underdog and trying to get John, you know, with sort of crumbs to go on his synthesizer. <laughs> And what's the story behind the lyrics of I'm a Computer? Well, it was really, it's quite a negative song, which is in a way unusual for me. Um, it's, you know, one door open, one door closes, this mm. way, that way, which way, I don't know sort of thing. It's all about a journey in life and the fact that it doesn't always work out, unfortunately, the way you'd like it to. You know, you go along and bang. It's, mm. And I think it may, I don't think it does a snakes and ladder thing, but it's the idea that you get to the top and then you're sent to the bottom and you're going here and you're being led there. That's ah. what it's about. And Pete, can you share what you were doing musically and, and how you'd come to meet John Lewis? I was a guitarist at 14 and uh, I, I played in a pop group and we, we wrote or I wrote, and a friend of mine wrote with me sometimes. We wrote original songs. They were very romantic, and I think the kind of thing 14-year-olds write. <laughs> Not really that good, but uh, to me, they were lovely. Mm. And uh, we were sort of popular in our own little town and uh, in all the village halls. We were big, yeah. <laughs> you know, big in youth clubs. Yeah. And, and then I, I went to London like everybody did, and I spent a lot of time going backwards and forwards to London because London at the time was the centre of the universe as far as music went. I used to play with Robin Scott, who wrote pop music, and his brother Julian, who also was on pop music. Uh, I got a phone call. I think Robin phoned me. I was in Sussex. He phoned me. He said, are we doing this track or I'm working with John or John was doing a track and needed a guitarist. And that was it. I got in my car and I drove to Earl's Court. Uh, I arrived late. Well, you know, I had sort of jumped in my car. Mm. John in a fit of peak. I remember him sort of looking very petulant and sort of saying, you're late. <laughs> I thought, well, you've just driven, you know, like through Earl's Court in my car, find your stupid flat. Uh, in those days, we only had an A to Z. We didn't have sat now. Mm. And you used to balance the A to Z on your steering wheel. And so I did a good job of getting there, I think. But John wasn't happy. I'm not sure I even recorded my guitar part. Uh, but I stayed over at John's flat in Earl's Court, I remember. And I probably went home the next day. But I also then... I did another recording for John as a guitar player in another flat 
very posh part of London. I can't remember. But then after that, I, I ended up sharing a flat with John in Shepherd's Bush. Oh, wow. <laughs> and how did that come about? I don't remember. I really don't. He probably had... I must have bumped into him and I was going, I've got nowhere to live, which was quite normal for me. Yeah. And he probably said, in the, I, I won't do John's accent. Oh, go on. I've got a lovely flat for you, Peter. <laughs> now I thought, well, I need somewhere to live. So I, I shared, uh, he, I had a room, he had a room. I never saw John because he was had this amazing social life, which I didn't have. Uh, I came complete without a social life. Uh, John had one and uh, off he went. But I, so we didn't see each other very often. And I was like, a, it was like Cinderella. It was like, I was Cinderella. It was like living with a, a not too ugly sister because he was a very good looking man. But he was always <laughs> off doing stuff. And I was left at home like cinders. And I was like cooking him stuff. I was a real idiot. I could, I'd make a night because I loved cooking. So yeah. I'd make some night, some jus or something. <laughs> and I'd leave it on the side for him. I remember once I did, I made some sort of jus. It was like a, and he said, Oh, I love that jam. And I thought it wasn't jam. <laughs> it's you, mate. That goes on your meat, what I made you. But anyway, <laughs> so that was the relationship we had. I was failing abysmally or trying very hard to meet people. And John was playing for Ballet Rombert and the Swingle Singers. Yes. And you were telling me prior the story when they came to the Shepherd's Bush flat. Well, I, I know they all turned up at his flat one day <gasps> uh, and sort of did some swingling. I, I can't tell you that about their personal lives, but John told me immediately afterwards. Ooh. Um, yeah. Ooh. And uh, and once John had to go and rehearse, uh, Ward Swingle, I think his name was, who ran, who was Mr. Swingle, Swingle. <laughs> uh, lived in Uckfield in Sussex. And I was going back down to Sussex and, and John cadged a lift with me. I remember that because I got a flat tire and John again was very put out. I thought, oh, so ungrateful. I took you all the way down here and got a flat. Well, actually, I made him late. That's why. <laughs> Pete, you and your persistent late. <laughs> but I didn't make him late. You know, he, he has to be responsible for his own decisions. <laughs> Absolutely. But was this John's demeanour in general or was it perhaps just directed at yourself? I think with me, he wasn't very happy with me and he could be very, he could be very cutting um, and dismissive. He was a bit bitchy, you know, in a sort of yeah. gay, a queenie sort of way. Uh, he had that ability to do that, that sort of, you know, clacking his heels and stuff. <laughs> and and looking back, do you think you took this personally or perhaps... I um... think I did. I was quite sensitive and I want... I You know, I, I, I wanted to be John's friend because John, like a lot of people I knew then, seemed to be the gateway to some sort of success. And I don't think that's actually true now. But to me, as I was probably... I don't know. When I first met John, I was probably about 18, 19. I can't remember. John was talented. And he seemed to be in demand. Mm. And you touched on it briefly, but when you're both at home as flatmates, um, what was he like to live with? Because it wasn't always harmonious, was it? He was prancing around about something. I can't remember what it was, but then he told me off for something that I hadn't done. I think I was hanging around the flat too often and I should be out oh. you know, on the streets or something. And then he said, and what's more, you had a whole kilo or whatever it was of my cheddar that I've just bought. And uh, I took him in the kitchen and there it was sort of mouldering away on the side merrily. I said, look, there's your cheddar, John. <laughs> but uh, he didn't say sorry or anything, but uh, that's a really matter. But um, no, he was he could be quite kindly. I rem he was kind to me at times. He was never very critical of my guitar playing. I wouldn't say he was in awe of it, because how could he be? I'm not a classical guitarist and I don't have the skills or knowledge he had. But I did have something which we all pop guitarists at that time had, which was the ability to improvise. Mm. And also I played him some demos that I'd done. I, and I think he, he he was intrigued by what I was doing. And also I'd, I'd done a lot of demos because I was writing songs for other people. And I'd always put a guitar solo in there somewhere or some guitar thing. So I think he actually enjoyed what I did. Uh, and I, maybe I'm belittling myself or not giving myself enough, cre not credibility, whatever the word is, because he, yeah, he was, he did like what I played and maybe, and I was good at the time, but I, I'm not that anymore because everybody's a good guitarist nowadays. You know, you have to go on YouTube for a week and you're a genius, you know. So he could be kindly and he did. I remember the man, he, he sent me off to see a guitarist called Timothy Walker who was at the time, I don't know if he's still alive or anything, but he was a, quite a well-established, well-known guitarist. And he said, go to him and have some lessons with him. 
I went a couple of times, but I, t- again, I wasn't. I wasn't a classic guitarist. I was like a rock and roll pop person. I couldn't, you know, it's like you know, it's a completely different field. Although I knew a bit of classical music. And am I right in saying that you worked with John at the Electrophone Studio? Yeah, yeah, that's why I recorded. I'm a computer. Ah, so what do you remember of your time over at Electrophone over in Neil's yard in Covent Garden? Oh, it, it was in Neil's yard. That's yeah. unbelievable because I did a lot of work in the Yard. Redwood Studios with a friend of mine, Andre Jackman. I sang a few Monty Python jingles and uh, I did, uh, what did I do there? I didn't realise it was the same place. I probably approached it a different way because I used to come down yeah. Baker Street to go to Electrophone. Well, I walked, I used to walk from Baker Street. Inside, uh, there was a huge synthesizer because John had one of the first Moog or Moog synthesizers, as it should be called, I believe. He had the, one of the first ones in Britain. I'm not, I'm not sure. Probably first. He, there weren't many, right. and it was prior to everybody having everything on their computer. And it was this massive thing. It looked like a telephone exchange. It had, you know, lots of little wires that you plugged in here. You move really? this, you plug in here. And he was very good at it. Very adept at uh, getting the sounds. He he knew how to work it, and he he had, he could get sounds very quickly on it analog sound was different and that's i think why people like songs like i'm a computer because the actual sound is very thick and warm and john did the froggy bass what he called the froggy bass which is the what what you know oh, 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 oh. it sounds like a frog because it goes oh, at the end of each note oh, and he also helped with the voc- vocoder which is the i'm a computer which was a vocoder which was an instrument i mean now it's replicated on on computers but it was this original machine where he played the notes i just said it i'm a computer and whatever he played followed my voice so and it was fun it was good fun it was good and um, we did it on a, a two inch tape and uh, i then went off to another studio and put the vocals on and i did the drums i changed the drums put pete thomas from uh, what are they called uh, Elvis Costello? I put Pete Thomas, Pete Thomas the drummer, and put him on there as a drummer. I remember some very interesting synthesizer stuff that John was checking. He said for Pete Townsend of the Who, um, who was very involved in synthesizer at the time. He did that won't get fooled again, which has that very very long synthesizer introduction. I don't know if John had anything to do with that, but he was doing stuff for him. But Electrophone was faster because we John was so good. You know, he was very talented and could play, which made a big difference. Uh, the studio was just a room with a big synthesizer and a bathroom because John used to run in there and clean his teeth. Oh, <laughs> he did have lovely teeth. But he'd come rushing in from lunch, run in there and clean his teeth. I mean, about lunchtime. I wouldn't say been to lunch. Well, he may yeah. have been to some kind of lunch. And he'd run in, clean his teeth and then talk to me. It sounds like a man after my own heart with good oral hygiene. But Pete, do you recall how John came to be involved with your song, I'm a Computer? I really don't know. I you think don't. there must have been a bit of time between me leaving his flat and meeting him again, because he was quite nice to me when he saw me <laughs> all forgotten about the cheese and uh, stuff like that. And he was quite kind. And um, I think he I think he was looking for work. You know, it was work to him because I paid him. I, I was working and I used to collect my money at the end of the month and I'd go and see John, you know, and paid him per hour to do it. But I knew him and uh, it, that's it. I paid him and he was happy. John, by this time, had released several tracks and albums under Wave Maker with Brian Hodgson at the Electron Studio and he'd worked on many of us. Did he give you any advice on releasing your track, I'm a Computer, now that it was finished? I think he had made records. I know, he, not records. Was it a record, I suppose, or recordings? Because I remember him saying to me once, one thing I do remember him saying to me is that, you know, because I was writing and he was quite complimentary and he said once, you know, don't worry, Pete, you never know. Sometimes these things will come back later on and you'll get just like I'm a computer did. I mean, this is yeah. like 20 years ago. Um, and he said that he said I made because they made a record, something to do with uh, what was it called? It was the, what was the book that Thomas More wrote or was it Thomas More? Ah, this is the Francis Bacon, which was the New Atlantis album from John and Brian Hodgson under their duo Wave Maker and their Electrophone studio. That's right. And he was right. And I don't think it did very well for him. Maybe it has now. But he was saying, you know, I've done this and sometimes these things just sort of are circular or they come back and you never know. Mm. And 
When you're not socialising or out working, was there a typical night in for John or for both of you? Did you kick back and perhaps watch TV or... Don't even think we had a television. The piano perhaps, because you mentioned that John had a piano in the flat. John played the piano a lot, but usually for a purpose. Like he was, mm. he rehearsed the Holberg Suite with Grieg for the ballet rumba, and it was the most fantastic thing I'd ever heard. I mean, he didn't wheel his piano into my bedroom and stuff like that. But he was in the other room and I heard him playing this music on the piano because it's very fast. I don't know if you know it. It's all played on violins, but John played it on the piano. And I thought, God, this is so lovely, this music. And and he could, he was very skilled, of course, and he could play straight off, no mistakes. I, well, I didn't know, but there was nothing. And uh, yeah, I loved it when he played that. It was lovely because he brought me into an, a, in a, to a place I, I hadn't been before, which is what, a lot of music always does to me, uh, you know, especially particularly classical music. I'm taken to a lovely place. But um, yeah, but he never had a typical evening in. I, I don't remember John ever being in. He was always out up to mischief. <laughs> and um, of course, at the Elsham Road flat was only a short walk from Earl's Court, which at the time was the gay capital of London in, in 1980s. But you were also friendly with the gay neighbours. Once going over the road where there's an Australian gay guy, a very amusing fella, and some other gay people who live there, and we had cheese on toast. And we were very happy, me and John, because we was, if we weren't having my jus, we were having cheese on toast. Remember how delicious it was, but I think it was because we were always starved. It's like I was very thin then, and the reason was I didn't eat. You know, you didn't have breakfast and you probably didn't have lunch, but you have something at some point. And you did a huge amount of walking because mm. even though I had a car, I didn't drive around London. Or maybe I t no, I didn't. I, you know, we walked everywhere, which is mm. why I said I walked from Baker Street to Electrofarm. I didn't get the tube. I walked. I always walked. You know, I couldn't afford not to. I think just to add a point to that about John, I think it's such a shame. Well, it's always a shame when people die, but he died at the wrong time because he could have done a lot more. I mean, he was in a very good position and in a way, so was I, but I don't want to go on about me, but he he created the music for pop music. I mean, he did pretty much most of pop music and he did most of I'm a Computer in a way. You know, it was my ideas, my tune, but he turned it into this thing. But as a musician, Pete, you're you're still working and releasing music. Are you working on anything at the moment? At the moment, I'm working on a K-pop song, which is a Korean pop song. I've written the song and I'm working with a Korean producer who's in Korea. And in a way, it's quite interesting because for me, it's like full circle because it's the kind of thing I would have wanted John to have done. It's mm. like John, but in Korea, you know, and I hope it turns out far better than I'm a computer. I think it will, and I'm looking forward to the results. So in a way, it's quite nice to be have this cycle. I think John would approve. Wow, it sounds exciting. And, and what's it called? Oh, my God. There you go, everybody. You heard it here first. Make sure you keep a lookout for Oh, My God by Pete Davis. But in regards to music, I've learned that the other reward, the financial reward, is not always instant. And you told a lovely story when we spoke prior about John being delighted with a cheque that he'd received in the past. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, John had put some music, or not put, he'd had some music that he'd written used in a film. And I think it was a kind of... Um, what would you call it? Not a niche film or an iconic film. It was a small film. Avant-garde, maybe? Avant-garde. <laughs> and every now and then, and he was delighted when it happened, and who wouldn't be? He got a check, and it was quite a large check, and he said it was only a tiny piece of music, but I get all this money. And and it's good to hear that, and, and I think that is the way it is in the world of music. 
if you're not involved in music, you might think that you just kind of open an imaginary letterbox and checks fall through and money and gold mm. coins. It's not like that. And John being a, a gay man and attractive and handsome and in good shape and well-groomed, do you recall if he had any steady or serious relationships, either intimately or even purely platonic? Uh, John once asked me if he'd slept with me, which I've, I, t- I, he hadn't slept with me, by the way. But I found it slightly insulting that he hadn't even remembered, you know. But somebody <laughs> said to me, don't worry about it. He's so promiscuous, he won't remember, <laughs> you know. And I thought, yeah. He oh. knew Tim Curry, the actor. The only people I met of John's were uh, a chap called Nelson who was a very sweet, sort of attractive. And he he was very muscular and handsome and a ballet dancer. And he deported himself well. And I remember him saying he'd been told off at his ballet lesson and the teacher was going, it's all with the shoulders, dear, or darling, or whatever. And he showed me. And it was with the shoulders. And, he, and I've always remembered that because he did it in such a graceful sort of way. He just went, I can't do what he did, but he did something. And I thought, I've never forgotten it. Wow. <laughs> Pete Davis, thank you so much for taking the time to share more about John Lewis and your time together. But before I let you go, how would you sum up John and your time working together? Um, I think John and I both lived at a very, or had that experience at a very good time, a very creative, positive time, but it was also the opposite at the same time. It was a bad time. And it's simply because we were poor. I don't know if being rich would have been any better. And his talent wasn't, didn't really come to the fore. It would have come to the fore since people would have discovered John as they are now. And he would have been incredibly successful, I'm sure, because he was uh, one of the original sort of pioneers without sounding cliched or corny of the synthesizer at that time. And not only that, he wasn't dabbling with it. He was a talented classical musician. So he had the knowledge that none of us have. We would have turned it on, pressed the button and run off like a couple of monkeys or something and go Ooh, in the corner, you know, we wouldn't know what to do. But John knew how to make things come out of it and could work it. And in that respect, it's sad and it's, it is a bad time. That was a bad time because who knew what was coming for John. But in that short period, he showed his potential and his he had a, you know he had a potential that was never seen never never exposed to 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 the to us the general public or to people or the music world and that's a sad thing but he did good while he was here Insight, ladies and gents, Pete Davis. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I know we exchanged a lot of emails, we spoke for a few hours on the phone, and even the recording itself, we scheduled an hour and we ended up speaking for three hours. <laughs> so many stories to tell. Such a wonderful insight that really adds to the character of John and bringing him and his story to life. For people like me that never met John and don't know John, so Pete, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. And as we just heard from Pete Davis there, he mentioned Pete Townsend of The Who. Well, I did find out that John had done some work for Pete Townsend on his 1982 album, which was recorded in 1981, called All the Best Cowboys Have Chinese Eyes. And John Lewis is credited as Fairlight CMI Programming. Now, the Fairlight CMI was a digital synthesizer, sampler and digital audio workstation for those like me, not fully in the know. But still, a good gig, no? And of course, I can't list a definitive list of all John's work, but safe to say that John never stopped composing, recording and producing music, whether it was for himself or others. As we heard from Brian Hodgson earlier, John's last notable work was the score for Doctor Who, which he was commissioned for in 1984, and sadly never got to fully finish, although we did get to hear a snippet of it. But... Just before John fell ill in 1984, he did complete a record that took me back, oh, I'm getting goosebumps, to my days as a young gay in London's G.Y. Astoria in heaven several nights a week. Because the track titled Thunder and Lightning by Heat Exchange was frequently thrown into the mix at Friday's Camp Attack and John Lewis played a major part in the record.
John Lewis, Gareth Marshall C and C Platt are all credited as writing the track. And in addition, John is the producer, arranger and programmer and recorded the record at Electrophon Studios before it went on to be mixed at Eel Pie Studios. Thunder and Lightning by Heat Exchange was released across the UK, Europe and the Americas with various additional remixes thrown into the mix. It was re-released on compilation albums in 1985, 1990, 1997 and in 1998 on a compilation CD titled Heaven, a nod to London's gay nightclub Heaven and in 1999 Stonewall Greatest Hits, acknowledged as a bit of a gay anthem and re-released twice in 2001 and again as recently as 2010. John's involvement in Thunder and Lightning under the name Heat Exchange is quite possibly his last notable completed work before he was admitted to Ham Green Hospital in December of 1984. John's mother Minnie makes a trip from Canada to be with her son along with John's close friends hoping to keep him alive and well long enough for an effective treatment to arrive. John's death was attributed to pulmonary embolism brought about by cryptococcosis meningitis often seen in the late stages of AIDS. His secondary cause of death was HTVL3, the earlier term for the acronym AIDS. John Lewis, a music composer aged 40, was cremated on the 12th of February 1985 at Haycombe Crematorium in Bath, and his ashes went on to be scattered in the Garden of Remembrance. That front page headline, Gay Plague Man Named, is about as cruel and stigmatising as the press got, not because the journalists or the newspapers were being kind or sympathetic towards John's friends and family, but because John's friends, despite being besieged by the national press, remained protective and loyal to their friend in death, as they did in his life. You can read all the newspaper articles and learn more about John's life and career on the Extra Tea blog. You can find the links in the show notes. It's been a real joy to learn more about John Lewis, the composer, and reading his achievements in the national and international press, and hearing from those that knew him best, his friends. It seems John didn't come to London in 1968 with hopes and dreams. He came with talent and ambition. John's achievements at each milestone far exceeded those of your average 30 or 40 year old. John composed and produced music scores for established dance companies and prestigious ballet and opera houses. He entered a partnership with Brian in Electrophon Studio to produce and record music, even when on occasion it was hard going. John was one half of the duo Wavemaker releasing two albums with Polydor Records. He was commissioned to compose and record music for singers, bands, television and even film. John's exceptional knowledge of music and synthesizers meant established musicians such as Pete Townsend and and Robin Scott turned to John. He spent most evenings playing in orchestra pits in London's West End musicals and came to own his own home in Kensington and Chelsea. It's clear John worked hard, and with the glittering lights of London's West End in the 1970s and 80s and a vibrant gay scene on his doorstep, John played hard too. With all that, there is no knowing what John would have gone on to achieve. HIV AIDS may have so cruelly taken John, his talent and his music, but it could never take the joy John's work brought and still brings to people today. Ladies and gentlemen, to play us out, I give you John Lewis. <laughs> 